This is an experiment. What do billionaires, cultural icons, and world-class athletes have in common? I'm about to find out. I'm John Aguilar, serial entrepreneur, former decathlete, and creator and host of the CNN Philippines business reality show, The Final Pitch. Each week, I try to unlock the secrets of Asia's world-class performers to come up with hacks that I can apply in my own life. My goal is to have you apply them in yours. This is the podcast designed to change your life. This is Methods to Greatness. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Methods to Greatness. This podcast is a series of interviews designed to unlock and test the best methods, habits, and practices of billionaires, legends, and icons from Asia from different fields of endeavor. I will attempt to unlock the secrets of these world-class icons through this podcast that will serve as an actionable guide to be the best you can possibly be. My name is John Aguilar, a serial entrepreneur and TV producer from Manila, Philippines. Creator and host of the CNN Philippines business reality show, The Final Pitch, and the real estate and construction TV show, Philippine Realty TV. I'm also the CEO of the technology venture builder, Dragon's Nest. Greetings to our listeners from the Philippines, Asia, and beyond. Methods to Greatness is available everywhere you listen to your podcast and also has video versions on YouTube and on Facebook. So how does one imitate or approximate greatness? How does one perform and stay at a top level? How does one stay relevant in a competitive industry? Our guest for today is a legend in the sport of basketball. He is an eight-time Philippine Basketball Association champion, five-time coach of the year, seven-time All-Star Game head coach, and most notably, he has guided Team Gilas Pilipinas to a historic run to the FIBA World Cup in 2014 after almost 40 years. His greatness goes beyond basketball, and he has pivoted to other fields of endeavor. He is the man responsible for making Puso or Heart the national battle cry in basketball's biggest stage. Please enjoy my interview with the one and only Coach Chot Reyes. Hi, Coach Chot. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me, uh, John. But I must admit, I'm uh, uncomfortable being part of the billionaires and icons. This I'm, no, I'm not a billionaire by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> but thanks for having me. Thanks for the invite. Yeah. I thought you were going to say you're uncomfortable having this face-to-face -face interview <laughs> no, with me. No, no. <laughs> Well, we are, we're sufficiently distanced. Yes, there's, there's, there's uh, <laughs> yeah. social distancing here. It's about, I think, two meters yeah. uh, between you and oh, I. Yeah, but yeah. thank you, Coach, for, for uh, joining us here today. I know My that um, I think prior to this, you've only gone out just once before. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right? Re but, reading. You know, good. It's a good respite to get out of the house. Yeah. Yes, yes. I must agree. We, we have to move on. And mm -hmm. I, I, I've always believed that with the right precautions, um, it it still is possible to Correct. to be able to do things yes. uh, like this, this this interview that we're doing today. So, Coach Shot, um, I, I wanted to start first with, um, I guess, uh, just recalling how I know you. Um, so we met officially, I think it was in the late 90s. <laughs> Your son, Josh, yeah. uh, was in the track and field team uh -huh. in high school. I was also part of the Ateneo track and field team yeah. in college. Yes. And I remember meeting you for the first time. You were the doting father <laughs> supporting uh, his, his athlete mm -hmm. um, uh, son, who I think that time was also in basketball. So, so he was a, a two-sport athlete. He was in track and field. He was also he in was, basketball. Uh, yeah, doing long jump, if I'm not mistaken. He was doing yeah, long yeah, jump. He was a long jumper. Yeah. That was a long time ago, late 90s. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to us about those times when, I guess as a father, you were also coaching, in a way, your son at that time, <laughs> even if it was in a different sport. Well, um, I've, I've always believed uh, that uh, while we encourage our, our children uh, to, to go into sports or whatever it is that they want, uh, I'm very careful not to be overly involved uh, and, and to keep a certain distance because uh, we, we want them to pave their own paths and... and achieve things uh, on their own merit. So, but uh, I make sure, and I know because from my time when I was growing up and playing, uh, how important it is to have uh, my parents uh, watching and supporting. So I made sure when I was uh, 
in that position to give my full support to to not only to Josh but all our all our other kids. Yeah. Yeah. So so being someone who was in the sidelines, you were supporting Josh. He was doing track and field. You had that distance, right? You were there as a supportive father, not as a coach. No, no, not at all. Because I don't know the first thing about the long jump. <laughs> I, I did track in high school, but I was a, a discus thrower. I was in the field oh. events, yeah. Uh, I won the gold medal in the UAP Juniors uh, discus in, I don't want to say the year, <laughs> but in high school when I was in, in high school. So, yeah, sports has always been in, in our blood. So, you know, uh, that's why when he, was, when he went out for the track and field team, I said, fine. But I, I'm sure it must have been tempting to give at least some form of advice, right? <laughs> Maybe not related to track and field. What, what was the dynamic like uh, being a coach, um, um, being an award-winning coach, and having your son out there uh, on the field? No, it was just about, um, I just wanted to make sure that, uh, I, I believe that, you know, in motivating, making sure that he's, he's he stays motivated. Uh, it was making sure that I didn't get in the way, and there were there was nothing else that was getting in the way. So whatever it was in, in in at home, when I knew that he had a competition or a meet coming up, we made sure everything was fine. He had his, his food, his everything. He had enough sleep. That was my role, just to make sure that he had enough sleep and that he wasn't doing so many other things. Um, but other than, you know, I wasn't the, okay, son, you can do this type now. Because um, I think one of the important things in, in motivating people and inspiring others that we have to remember is we, we have to understand and read the situation. And if you see, and, and a lot of great athletes, the reason that they're great is because they are internally motivated. So in, in those situations, there's not much that you need to do. And so I saw that in, in Josh, he was very internally motivated there was no need for any extra external motivation for myself so i i saw my my role really was to just make sure that there were no demotivators nothing distracting around him to allow him to uh, be at his peak during the competition time and i think we succeeded because uh he he won so you know uh, i'm very happy for that so that's your observation from your own son being internally motivated. How would you compare that to, I guess, if not hundreds, thousands of players that you've handled who have physically um, been there with you through thick and thin? Um, is there uh, a kind of, uh, I guess, uh, characteristic that you would describe successful athletes um, from those, I guess, who are, I, I, I wouldn't want to say um, mediocre, but I would dare say average. Yeah. Well, there are great athletes and there are winners. Uh, we've seen so many great athletes in all sports, not only in basketball, in track and field, I'm sure you've seen football, all sports, great, fantastic athletes. They have all the physical tools, but they never reached any level of greatness. So that's where you separate the winners. And that's, that's what I found. The great athletes, they're blessed with that natural ability. But the winners, they're the ones with the, with the natural ability and that inner drive. And the winners, like I said, the winners, the reason that they are winners is they're internally motivated. They have something inside, that, that, that internal drive that pushes them that you don't, they don't need a coach, they don't need anyone. Sure, they need somebody to guide them. Sure, they need somebody to put the program. Uh, maybe they need somebody sometimes to rein them in. But that's the difference that I've seen. The, the, the winners, you, you don't need to push them. The, you know, you, they're, the, the reason that they're winners is because they are internally driven and that they're internally motivated. And that's the lesson I bring up to today and even in my work with executives and leaders in other organizations. I always tell them motivation is overrated because we cannot really, and, and what I find is that the science shows that uh, what people expect leaders to do, there is a mismatch because leaders cannot really motivate their people because real motivation is, is within. 
So the only one who can really motivate oneself is yourself. Uh, and the, the problem is um, every other organization or every other company or owner expects their managers to motivate their people. Which so, what you're saying is really shouldn't be the case because yes. I guess it's a matter of really selecting the right people to be part of your team from the get-go. That, that's one. And the, the, the thing we can do as leaders, as managers, is to make sure that the environment and the surroundings are, are conducive for them to get their work done. And then, then their, their, their motivation kicks in because um, I'm a firm believer in the motivation uh, 2 or 3.0 uh, model, which says that motivation really is about autonomy, mastery, purpose. And especially autonomy, mastery, mastery and, purpose. and purpose. Especially now, I get that question all the time. Uh, you, you know, I do a lot of executive coaching, and, I, and one of the top questions is, how can we motivate the millennials and even the Gen Z oh, today? They can't, we can't motivate that's, them. That's something that a lot of people right? are grappling with. And the answer is because we're trying to motivate them the way we were motivated. Right. And it no longer works. What they want now is autonomy, mastery, purpose. I so can, Coach, how yeah. were we motivated back then? Um, um, what, what? In, the, in the old ways of doing things, the more linear work, as against now, which is very the digitally disruptive world where it's so labu labu, it's it's all things at, at all the time, right? Before in the in the more linear world, uh, the old carrot and stick worked. You know, you do this, you get this, you do this, you get this. Now I'm sure you will agree, you work with a lot of startups and venture and, and people who are in the tech business, and that's things are not that simple. That's it's not that simple. So, but what they want, what I find and what they want, they want to know that they, uh, that they can uh, steer their own ship, they steer it well, and they steer it for a purpose larger than themselves, autonomy, mastery, purpose. So as a manager, as a leader, we have to understand that because those are the drivers or the levers that lead to sustained uh, peak performance. So that's 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 what I've learned even in basketball and, 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 and in work today. So in my job in Gilas, uh, my number one responsibility is to create strong uh, individual relationships with my players. Because by doing so, then I understand what's important to them, what drives them, what what uh, what are their hot buttons, you know, what, what's, it, what's important to them. And uh, that is what is, uh, imp what th th those are the things that I use to motivate them. I, that's why more than motivation, I like to call it inspiration. To, my job is to inspire them, but to really motivate them, uh, it's, an, it's, it's an inside thing. Motivation is, is a heart issue. It's, it's an internal thing. Because you can motivate somebody for a while, but if it's external, it will wear off very quickly. Right. right? And even to get to that level where that person is worthy to be in that team, yeah. I guess says something a lot about how they've motivated themselves to get to that point. Because you have in the Philippines, hundreds of thousands of aspirants. They all want to be in the PBA. Yes. They all want to get there, right? There, there's this, if that were the carrot that was in front of them, they all want to get there. But... What you're saying is that the ones who possess not just the talent, but also the, I, I guess, the inner drive yes. to get there gets them to your door as coach of yep. the national team. The inner drive or you, Simon Sinek calls it the why or the purpose or whatever, or the North Star, whatever. But there has to be something bigger than just, you know, what is your why? What is your purpose? What is your inner uh, reason for for wanting something. Sure, you know, a lot of, especially those who are less fortunate, they wanted to get to the PBA to improve their lives, of course, to, for life. But other than that, what's going to take them now to the next level? Because everybody else, that's what they want to get, the reason why they wanted to get to the PBA, right? But there's, like you said, hundreds of thousands of Filipinos who want to get there. And they're what, 12 teams times 15, that's 180 players, less than 200 players. So. 
how do you get there? And then of those 200 players, there's another 12 spots on the national team. So even more, how do you get there? Right. You know, Coach, I've always been curious about the love affair that Filipinos have with basketball. Um, you know, we've, we've always had that chip on our shoulder. We've always been, I guess, bridesmaids. Well, not <laughs> always, but recently, thanks yeah. to you, um, we've been able to penetrate the world stage. Um, but, you know, you don't have to do the math. You see the stats. You see how Filipinos in general, if not for, I guess, some foreign blood, mm -hmm. um, generally, we're, we're not built for the sport. Yep. Uh, but what is it about basketball you feel that really makes it, or Filipinos really gravitate towards the sport? What is it about this sport in particular? I think there's something in the, um, the way the game is played. It, the creativity, the spontaneity, you know, the, the um, instant gratification you get for scoring a basket, making a good move. Because... Soccer, I was also in, in the varsity team in soccer when I was in, in school. It's a beautiful game. I love soccer. But it's not too enam the Philippines Filipinos are not too enamored with it because they want they want the scoring. They right. want you, don't, the, you don't get a lot of highlight yeah, reels from yeah. that. Right? They don't we can find we, we those who appreciate soccer, we can find a one zero or zero zero <laughs> game, a beautifully played game, but not all Filipinos get that. But every Filipino would love a 100 to 90 or 80 right. to 70 game because of the lots of highlights. That's one. The fact that uh, for you to succeed, you have to work together as a team that speaks to our Bayanian spirit. And it's very easy. You know, you just have a make hip, make makeshift uh, hoop uh, and a, a little sand lot somewhere and a a pole with a hoop, then you can you can already play. It, it's very easy. You can play in your flip flops, so it, it's it's very easy. So we have really become uh, enamored with it. Uh, so I think those are the things: uh, the creativity, the improvisation, the the bayanihan, uh, you know, the collaboration. Uh, that's that's I, I think why it's so uh, it's so appealing to the Filipinos. It's. It's kind of a way for us to show our artistry because even if we're not among the world's best, I think we, I think it's you can you can also argue that we are some of the world's most uh, skilled, you know, in terms of ball handling right, and, and right. you know the shots that we that we put up and we're among the most creative. So you know, and the sixth man, don't forget the sixth man. <laughs> yeah, of course, <laughs> that's very important. Yeah, yeah. So in terms of you growing up as, I guess, a multi-sport athlete, um, and basketball eventually is what, I guess, is the path that you chose. What was it like being a basketball player? And what were the events that led you to be the coach that you now are? Um, I was playing all the way from Obviously, from elementary, I started in a, in the soccer varsity, and then it became uh, basketball. And then in high school, I made the varsity again uh, for UAP. At the same time, I made the track and field team. I also made I could have made the soccer team as well. That's a lot. I just didn't have the time. Yeah, um, uh, but I really wanted to graduate athlete of the year. So you know that's why did I did it happen. Yeah, I was I was nice. athlete of the year. So um, uh, it was just uh, it, it was just a question of wanting something and being willing to make the sacrifices to make it happen. You know how it is in Ateneo. Yes. The, the athletes oh. don't get any special. No way. No way. I wish we, we <laughs> no, had that not luxury. At all. But no, 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 no special treatment at all. <laughs> so um, very early, we learned as athletes to prioritize. To manage our time, to you know, to understand the value of rest, recovery, of discipline, all of these other things that you know, own being that sports really teaches you. So, for me, that was the that was the big thing about being an athlete and and being involved in sports. Uh, uh, growing up uh, in you know while elementary, high school, and and in college, and um, 
while I was in college, I was again on the varsity. And that's where Josh came when we were very young. I was only second year college. Second year college. Yes. That's why. So you were what, 19? Yes, 19 years old. Uh, so I was a working student for the last, uh, from second year college onwards. Uh, I was working and, and studying and coaching. Wow. Because to, to augment my income, I was uh, Father Holscher. I don't know if you remember. Oh, yes, course. yes. He offered me the Paya Aspirants job at the High School wow. when I was second year college. So that was my initiation into coaching. But I was still studying and I still had to play because that's where my scholarship was uh, you know, dependent on being mm -hmm. uh, playing in, in the varsity. Um, so those were two very, very tough years, but I got through it. I graduated on time. Um, and when, when I graduated, uh, I had an offer to play for the, then the PABL, then it became PBL, which is now like the, the D league. Uh, I had an offer to play there, but I had an offer to continue working for the company with which I was already working because I, like I said, I was a working student. And the salary was the same. So I said, weighing things, I already had a kid. I said, I thought this was the longer term, uh, better option was to already go into corporate work. So I, uh, I said no to the basketball offers and, and uh, went into actually working to corporate work. Um, a few years later, the company that I was working with, uh, I after a, a couple of years, I moved. I went to Pure Foods, and one of the first things I did, Pure Foods Corporate, not, okay. not, not, basketball not the basketball coach, team. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that company decided to enter the PABL, and we were offering contracts to fresh grads that were five times what I was making already. So I said I was a few years too late. If, if this were the salary that was, if these were the offers that I got coming out of college to play in the commercial league, I might have continued playing in the commercial oh, wow. league. Yeah. Okay. So it was just a matter of timing. So uh, that, that's how it began. Uh, we put together the PABL team of Pure Foods. After two years, there was an opportunity because the Eco Tandwai franchise was disbanding and they offered it to us. And so that was my uh, first project. One of they they gave me that as a project to do a feasibility study on uh, the value of entering the PBA, and so we did. We entered the PBA, but again, I was an executive. I wasn't uh, part of the coaching staff or the management staff of the team. So that that's where it began. Wow, yeah, that's where it began. But I think prior to that. Uh, and just to go back uh, to, to the conversation, you mentioned earlier Father Holscher, Raymond yeah. Holscher. Uh, may God rest, you yeah. know, uh, bless his soul. Um, he was, I, I guess, widely considered that time, um, I guess, the patron of, yeah. of sports. The athletic in, director, in yeah. The athletic he, director yeah. of, of Ateneo that time. Yeah. And uh, I personally uh, was one of uh, the people that he, the athletes that he supported that time. And this was at a time when you don't have like the, the contracts or the arrangements that student athletes now we get. We wish. <laughs> right? I mean, we that wish. time, I remember uh, Father Holscher would personally use his contacts. Yeah. Let's say, if, you know, hook me up with Adidas or, yeah. or, or um, Asics so that they would um, support me with uh, my spikes, my, yeah. my track and field spikes. Because yeah. the school didn't have enough budget, right? Yeah. That was unheard of. I mean, Same thing with us. We were already the basketball team. And you were already yeah, the basketball team. We had team, to yet. find sponsors right, to on your get own. us yeah, uh, shoes and even just at least a bag or whatever. Right. And, and yeah. international travel, forget it. That's not even Nothing, yeah. you know, part of the, the arrangement, right? Yeah. So you know, just looking back at that time and what we have now, what would you say would be the difference in terms of... Because obviously you have to figure things out along the way, right? Things are not given to you. And personally for me, I, I thought that was a very character building mm -hmm. uh, part of my life because I did not take things for granted. I knew that every ounce of success that I would get out of the sport was because I worked hard for it to get there, right? Like, like you, I was also 
um, the athlete of the year and in college when, when I graduated. But um, a lot of it was really due to the fact that I had to look for people who would support me. And um, a lot of the time, it was out of pocket. <laughs> and if I was not internally motivated, I would not be able to get to right, right. where I got to. Um, can you compare those times with our high school collegiate athletes now? What would you say? Obviously, they're more privileged now. They have the resources. But how is it different? But at the same time, how are also the athletes now in a lot of ways better than how we were back in the day? Um, there's no comparison just in, the, in terms of uh, environment, resources, everything. Um, I guess it's, it's the product of the times. I think now the situation is that uh, uh, I think the school realizes now the value really of sports and athletics towards everything else in, in that, that, that uh, is important to the school, right? So they're putting the resources behind it. Same thing with the alumni, they're really putting resources behind it. So uh, there is really no, uh, it, it's completely different from our time when we really never got any support at all. In fact, it was even a stigma against us. If we were athletes, if we were jocks, it was taken against mm -hmm. us. Now they have, they have uh, academic- uh, Scholarships. Scholarships. They have extra tutors. Right. They have all this help. They can do five years instead of four and years. And maybe condos and cars. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry, I. So, <clears throat> so you know, like I said, that's unheard of in, in our time. I mean, uh, um, uh, the the but like you said, yeah. But then now the the players who are coming out now, uh, they're also of a very different. A level their their talent their yeah. their abilities i mean you know uh are very different so uh, i think it's it's just a product of um evolution i think it's the way things are now and the only thing i i really wish is that uh the values still remain you know the things that are really important and I'm seeing now, I think in looking at our program, it, it's, it's still largely there. You know, I, I, we still see the values of brotherhood, of teamwork, of discipline. Um, I think now they're going more and more towards going back to, to getting players on the teams who are also from the high school and from the, from the grade school. So I think that's a good sign as against going out and getting all the others from, from other places. So... You know, uh, for me, the important thing is to to maintain the standards, the academic standards, because that's that's really what what we stood for, you know, as an institution before. So, uh, if as long as that's maintained, uh, then um, everything else is like I said, it it is it's a it's a product of 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 the times. It's. The, the program has to evolve. The school has to transform. Has to evolve. So, you know, uh, that that's my take on it. Yeah, and coach, you know, one thing that I've always always observed from, I guess, athletes from the national team is that a lot of them um, go to college. They compete. Uh, that is their quote unquote full time job, right? I'm not naming schools, I'm not naming institutions, but um, there is a tendency sometimes for that to be the be all and all of their existence, right? You are an athlete, first and foremost, just happen to be in this school, mm -hmm. enrolled in the program, right? Yeah. Um, and what happens is uh, when eventually after their collegiate career, if they don't have a league, I mean, basketball, you're, you're lucky because you have your PBA, you have your other leagues, but if you are from another sport, there is no next step for Very you. Limited, yeah. Right. I mean, you may be part of the national team, but how far can that take you in terms of sustaining yourself? So that's always been the struggle of national team athletes. Mm -hmm. I think if you're if you're like like for us, for example, in Ateneo, um, you're treated as a student first and foremost. 
who just happened to be in a sport, yeah. right? Or at least that's how I felt that time, right? And um, I guess it also prepares you for, for the journey after college. Mm-hmm. Because personally for me, what that gave me was the ability to be able to see and prioritize what I needed to do and make things happen at the time, at the right time, yep. right? I'm sure in a lot of ways that was also your experience, um, yeah. I guess, in high school and college. A lot of times you were wondering, why am I even doing this, right? Why are you doing going through all this sacrifice? And it's as if, you know, the... You know, it's as if the school didn't even care because they, they weren't giving you enough support. But that's why I'm happy now that uh, it's opened the eyes and, and the school is now giving a lot of support, not only to basketball, but I think even even to the other sports, they're getting more support now than their, their athletes used to get. So, uh, And I think that's good because uh, there, there's a lot to, to, to being... Uh, to being in sports, that's 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 such a strong character builder, and and schools should really support it. However, they have to understand, uh, like you said, that they are uh, student athletes, right. not not the not other the other way, way around. Yeah, that's that's the important thing. But the problem is, I think, as usual, we're getting a lot influenced by what we're seeing in the U.S., where you know all of this one and done stuff in, in colleges, and a lot of the high school phenoms or the great talents don't even go to right, college right. anymore. So um, so you think that's a bad thing? Uh, it's hard to tell because um, a lot of the icons that they have now, uh, a lot of the icons in the startup, in the tech world, <laughs> <laughs> some of them didn't even go to college. Right, some of them right. went to, to the Harvards and the Yales. But there goes the non-linear way yeah, that things work the, now. Yeah, right? but now... A lot of people say, why, why am I going to do this? So-and-so didn't go there. So-and-so did, was a dropout. So, you know, it, it's, it's really hard to tell because right now the times are so different. Times are so different. So the key is to really be very aware and just to have a very agile and open mindset. Very, very good point. I think, um, especially right now, uh, things are way different from back in the 90s, even 2000s, right? So right now, a new company can be born just a few months old. Um, If it really addresses a problem and it does it well, can get a multi-million dollar valuation with the right team, right? Things are not the way they worked before. And at the same time, it's very um, scary, Mm -hmm. I would think, just because, you know, sometimes you put value in something that is not so tangible. It's not really there. <laughs> it's not really there, but you have to have that gut instinct that this team can make it happen. They're addressing a, a, a need, yep. and this can potentially be something that will be able to be, let's say, your next Airbnb or next Netflix, for that mm-hmm. matter. Um, from your experience being a coach, and I'm saying this, both in basketball and in the corporate scene. Is there anything that you give as an advice to people who are addressing big problems? Let's, 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 let's start, I guess, with, with the basketball and transition to the corporate <laughs> world. What is a big problem that you've had to face? I know you've had a lot. Um, wherein the odds were stacked against you? But you gave that sort of inspiration, not motivation, but inspiration to your team that allowed them to be able to, to achieve your goal. I think in basketball, the most important, or sports in general, the most important thing is to understand uh, and have a real clear picture to be brutally honest about uh, where you are, what the situation is, and what can be done, what cannot be done. I think that's that's got to be the starting point. Um, by having that lens, then you can see uh, what the problem is and what the potential solution is. And then you can go to the next step to figure out, do I have what it takes to solve that problem? Do I have that solution? Any particular instance that you can recall um, 
coaching any of your teams or, or maybe even the national team? Well, when I came to Talk and Text, the last team I coached, very objectively, I told the owners, we have too much talent. And they said, what? <laughs> yeah, we have too much talent. We were, I, was, I would think we were the highest paid. We had the highest payroll in the entire PBA. But in their, in Talk and Text, 10-year existence or what, since before I arrived, they had won a grand total of one championship. And that was the tournament where it was kind of a special tournament because the Centennial team was training. So most of the players were gone and the teams were allowed to get two imports. So it was kind of a special tournament. But other than that, they haven't won a championship. So uh, uh, it was just quite brutally and honest and, and obviously to say that uh, I, I said we have too much talent. And I can remember when the, the first night that... Uh, uh, Chairman MVP and Mr. Ricky Vargas uh, spoke to me. They asked me, "Okay, but with the lineup now, can we? Can you take us to the to the finals?" And I told them, "Yes, in one year, I'll take you to the finals. I can take this team to the finals." Obviously, before I went to the meeting, I already t took a look at their roster, did an analysis of the other rosters in the league, and all that. And one of the first things we did was uh, we. If it were even possible, we decreased our level of talent because you can be. There's such a thing as getting too talented that mm -hmm. you know right. uh, things can't get done because so everyone. So you have your egos, yeah, you have so, your yeah. expectations that yeah. they all want to perform, right? But obviously, not everyone can be yes. the star all Correct. the time. Yeah. So uh, fortunately, it happened in in uh, exactly the first in. Uh, before my first year was up with Talk and Text, we did take the team to the final and, and we won. We won a championship in that first year. So uh, that's the starting point. You have to come in with your eyes uh, wide open. So that was the, that was the uh, important thing in Talk and Text. It was the same thing with uh, the national team when they appointed, they appointed me Gila's coach. Remember, I already had a chance in 2007 and, and we didn't do well in Tokushima. And then I retired already from the PBA in 2012, but MVP asked me to stay a couple more years. I had retired from the PBA because I said at 50, it was time for me to do other things. As, you know, it, I had, it was already 20 years in the PBA, so I said time to do other things with my life. Uh, but MVP asked me to stay for two more years to coach Gilas. And so I said, uh, after much thought, because I, I didn't have a good experience in 2007, uh, much thought and consultation with my family, with my wife. Are we going to put ourselves to this again? Uh, so we said yes. And uh, it was, again, we began with a very honest assessment of the program. And the, the assessment was what we are doing now is not working. So are you willing to do things differently? So that was the, that was the same thing. That's, that's the beginning. So it has to start with that. So now you, you put it, uh, apply it to um, work or a startup or business or a company, it's the same thing. Uh, when I took over TV5, I had to begin with a very brutally honest assessment of our situation in TV5. And that assessment meant we cannot bang heads against the two giants. It's no use. We just... There's no use. We are proudly number three, undisputed number three. So, so for context now for our listeners who are not from the Philippines. So TV5 is the TV network. Yeah. Uh, at, at the time was the third um, in the ratings game. Yes. So you have your, your ABS-CBN ABS and your GMA7. GMA. Those are the two leading networks. Yes. And I would say a far third. Far third. But undisputed. But undisputed. Because third. depends on who you talk to, ABS or GMA, they will say they are number one or two. Right. Uh, us, we are undisputed. Definitely number three. Yes. <laughs> one of the biggest trends in fitness right now is the proliferation of home gyms. And we've partnered with Italian wellness solutions provider Techno Gym to give you your weekly dose of high tech fitness equipment and exercises that you can consider for your home. Joining me is Techno Gym Philippines Sales Director Marvin Navarro. 
So Marv's our equipment for today is none other than the Techno Gym Scale Row. Nice. So John, this is our indoor rower. Um, when Techno Gym endeavored to create this machine, they really wanted to do it right and to be the best in the market. So they partnered with Olympic rowing medalist Scott Durant to come up with the design and the features of it. As you can see here, there's a logo of Aquafeel. It actually feels like you're rowing on water. You row indoors, but when you go to, you know, the water already, it translates perfectly. It's also the only rower in the market that where you can train cardiovascular endurance and strength. This knob, the white part shows you what you're using air resistance, but once you reach the red, you're already using magnetic resistance. And that magnetic resistance allows you to do strength training. Oh. So that is unique in the market. Like every other Techno Gym machine now, there is a digital component to it. So it has a dedicated app, which I want to demo to you. You can do different programs. Let's do an interval program. Let's demo it for you. Okay, so you can see here we have a pace boat. So it makes it a little bit more interactive. You have someone that you can race with. Here, you can see the profile of your stroke. So they say that the perfect stroke has somewhat of a bell shape in terms of the resistance profile or your effort profile. And lastly, you can find more parameters of the workout. So with the mobile application, you can do so much more with the skill row. I always used to just consider rowing machines as a piece of equipment for cardio. Now this piece of equipment has blown my mind away. It's practically a weights machine in that it can give you the kind of resistance that you would normally get from you know, the heavier back exercises that you would do in the gym. If you're someone who's very particular about the time that you put in the gym, I highly recommend the skill row. It's an awesome piece of equipment. Methods to Greatness in partnership with Techno Gym Philippines has come up with recommended fitness at home equipment to power your workouts. These are fitness solutions designed to drive and complement your training, whether you're a seasoned multi-sport athlete or you just want the very best equipment for your home gym. So get in touch with a Techno Gym consultant at sales at esports.ph via mobile at 63917 5745578 or through technogym.com and give the promo code MTG. That's the Methods to Greatness promo code MTG and the experts over at Techno Gym will hook you up with the best premium home gym equipment and gear available in the market today. And um, that time, as a basketball coach, all of a sudden now you're thrust to lead yes. A TV network. So this is a different ball game altogether. Yeah. I mean, yes, you will be coaching this institution, but all of a sudden you're not talking about plays, right? You're talking about TV shows. Yes. But what was that experience like for you? I, I'm sure it was a totally, totally different. Um, but but I want because you're getting into it. You said that you applied similar. Yeah. I guess, ways of thinking into how you led TV5. Let's talk about that now. Yeah. What, was, what was the mindset going So it's the TV same 5? mindset. It's a scouting, the scouting report. Uh, just to be very, very honest, brutally honest, and to say that uh, if we go towards this path, I mean, we were bleeding profusely. I mean, it's public knowledge, TV5, right. bleeding profusely. And I said, there's no way. There's no way to to get out of this uh, situation unless we do things differently. It has to be different. It has to be radically different. And uh, so that was to first realize that, uh, like I said, we couldn't compete with the two in there because what I learned in sports is you cannot play the other team in their area of strength. You have to find uh, an area where you can win. Right. And so that drove the decision to reposition uh, and pivot from being a general entertainment network to a sports network. Okay, you know, that I've always been curious with that because I don't know if the chicken or the egg came first. I don't know if in the minds of management, 
They wanted to transition to sports. Therefore, it made sense to get you to head TV5. Or what you're saying now is that you came on board first. Yeah. And then because of your scouting report, <laughs> yeah. figured that that was the best place to go. Yes. Was it just coincidental that you were a sports coach now tasked to lead the, um, the network? And it just so happened that the scouting report said that sports was the way to go now. Um, that's a good question. I haven't thought of it, but I I'm sure my, my um, predisposition and the fact that I'm a sports coach had a lot to do with it. But again, if, if you're in that business and you take a look at the genres, there is entertainment, musical, drama, news, sports. So right. you check the other boxes. There's, we're far from the, other, from the two networks in all of the other things. So the only one where place that we could uh, win was in sports and digital. I think even before the other two, TV5 was the first to dip its toes into digital because we were willing to disrupt ourselves. Obviously, the two were not because they their bread and butter was right. television, was broadcast, right? And so, it's going to be hard for them to even yes. go outside of their yeah. core because... So, they were such a big organization. They, and and that's their, you know, they didn't want... To rock the boat. Yes. Yeah. And so we were the first five years ago, we, we were already producing content for digital only that wasn't going to be on television. We were the first to show um, the Dota Esports World Championships. Mm -hmm. So we were pioneers. So we were really doing things that were, you know, and, and now everyone's... In, in talking about esports, though everyone's doing digital, right? So, but that came out of that realization that we have to find an arena or a, 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 a place where we can win. And that was it in, in sports. So, uh, that came from, from that realization, from, from just being, I call that grounding. When I, when I speak, I, I talk about I have five G's for, for mastering resilience and the starting point or building resilience. And the starting point is always you have to ground yourself in reality. And that's, that was it. We had to really face the facts that we are not going to succeed in this trajectory. Obviously now TV5 through no, with no contribution, no credit to me, it's, it's all the current management now. Obviously now TV5 is going another direction because now it's it's a good time. Now they're legitimate number two. Yeah, now it's a good time. Because, yeah. um, well, th this uh, podcast is happening um, uh, September, mid-September. Yeah. So now, um, ABS-CBN, the, depends on who you ask, the number one yeah. or number two network um, was um, taken out, yeah, shut down, shut down. Yeah. Um, by the current administration. Yes. Um, and now they are legitimate number two. And now that they find themselves in that spot, should they change the game again? Because now they, they yeah. are legitimate number two. They can yes. play the same game. And I've, I've read some scouting reports that said that they are coming up they are. with they are. Yeah. Uh, shows that are going to go compete head-to-head yes. -head against, so, yeah. against um, GMA. Rightly so. They're, they're, of course, uh, I'm a believer that situation dictates strategy. So now it's a perfect time for them now to, again, re, to, to, uh, to pivot and, and do other things. Um, but I believe that uh, what we did then, the number, the most important thing we did there was we stopped the bleeding. So we really stemmed the bleeding. And that allowed us to do several things. We, we were able to renew our franchise. Uh, uh, in my time as CEO, we renewed it for another 25 years. We were able to sign another an ex, another CBA agreement. And we were able to do at, at least a lot of the fundamentals and, and stuff. And now they're able to do a lot of things. Again, what TV5 is doing now is no not, not no... Uh, credit to me at all, it's it's now under the new management. But I thought where we were in 2016, so that's four years ago when I was the CEO, uh, I, I think it all began with that, with that very clear understanding of uh, what the problem was 
and what is the potential solution. So we did that, uh, that partnership with ESPN and it allowed us to cut our programming costs drastically. And like I said, stop the bleeding for a while. And so, now, so why did getting ESPN on board cut your costs? What was the dynamic behind that? Because uh, to be able to produce content uh, for a TV network for operating on 16 hours is very, very expensive. And the cost of uh, the partnership with, with uh, ESPN at the time was like 50% of that cost. Okay. So, however, it... it but however, it put us in a completely different genre. We were no longer general entertainment. And that means that we had access to a much smaller slice of the advertising pie. So less, much less advertising revenue, but much less uh, expense as well, product cost and, all, and right. all that. So like I said, we were able to improve our bottom line significantly. Uh, in our first uh, couple of years so that, you know, uh, like I said, now they are able to uh, do more things. As, right. So as, I, I understand how that would save um, you on your, your overhead. But also at the same time, I, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, but around that same time, you also had a licensing deal with Bloomberg. Yeah, that was a signal. The signal. The signal. The cable, uh, our cable affiliate. Cable uh, sister uh, right. company, the right. Signal, yeah. So correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that time Signal was also having problems with that deal because to get a license from um, Bloomberg, you had to pay a licensing fee, which I believe was in the hundreds of millions of pesos, right? So I think, you know, right from the bat, you're already negative. And on top of that, to have the production cost of... Yeah producing your own shows. So that to me did not make sense. So how would you explain that move? Yeah, well, uh, first of all, I'm not, the, I'm not the right person to ask because I wasn't, I'm, I, I, I've never been part of Signal, Brain Thrust or Management. So I don't know how, uh, what their thought process and their thinking was at that time. But I do know that they, uh, did they terminate it quickly or they cut it? Uh, I think not sure. it was there for a few years and yeah. then finally, so, I think, yeah. after bleeding so they, much, they let it go. then yeah. they, you have to. So have I don't to, know. Right? I don't know at that point. But for us, all I could speak of was the thinking behind the, the repositioning of, of TV5 into a primarily sports network. Well, sports and news. So we still had our news, yeah. Okay, so I've always been curious with how people in general work with someone like MVP or so for those who don't know him so Manny V Pangilinan and one of the countries uh, I would say uh, he's one of the best minds in business that we've ever had mm -hmm. um, obviously his international experience lends a lot to um, the way I guess his mind works in, in, in decision making in general what was it like working with MVP first as a coach and next as the head coach now of TV5? Um, it was, it was uh, perhaps one of the best, uh, if not the best uh, situations I could find myself in as a coach because he's kind of the ideal owner, you know, an owner who understands the game, they understand sports, they know the dynamics and, and all of that. But they, and they put in the resources behind you. So they give you whatever you need uh, to win. And still they don't uh, interfere. They let you do their job. Yes, he'll call you for, for meetings and he'll, he'll ask why, why you did this, why, why that happened and so on and so forth. But for me, that's, that's just natural. He owns the team, right? And all he wanted was to understand that you have a plan and what right. your plan is. Uh, and just like anything, if you could justify it, then you know he, he's fine, he, could, he likes it. Obviously, he doesn't like to lose. He hates losing. Uh, for him, there's no such thing as a good loss. For him, a loss is a loss. It's a good uh, position yeah, to take. <laughs> yeah, there's no... So, um, but as a coach, that's all you'd ever ask for. As a coach, what you want is an owner that is going to give his full resources behind you 
and allow you to coach the way you see fit. And that's uh, the situation that I, I have with uh, that I had with the MVP. And it was the same thing with uh, in in business uh, with running a business. Uh, you know, there was a time that uh, in our time in in TV five, uh, very few people know this, but we were very close to just getting shut down when the okay. when the losses were just getting to be insurmountable, and of course, the question on 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 whether I was fit for to be the to lead the company or not. Because I wasn't, I was the head of sports and and, and media five and, and sales, uh, and and uh, suddenly our CEO quit at the time, Noel Lorenzana. So I was just interim CEO first, but uh, eventually they gave me the the uh, they made it official. Of, as you will imagine, there's a lot of questions, but um, MVP came in and weighed in and and and. Uh, gave me his support uh, and so the board as well and again as an executive that's uh, that's all you can ask for that that you get the the support and they allow you to do uh, to run it the way you see fit and who would imagine after all those years that TV5 would pivot that way but I thought uh, it certainly it it, it made a lot of people take notice. It was big news, right. you know, a, a network suddenly pivoting and, you know. But again, if you take a look at where the network is now. It was an, an orthodox move, I yeah. would say, and, right? And if, you've, if you know me as a coach, that's, that's, that's how I coach the game. We, we do things, we do a lot of things that are out of the ordinary, really. really. So... Um, People talk about small ball that was made popular by the uh, uh, Golden State Warriors in the PBA, right? in, in the NBA, right? In 2016. Sorry, right? sorry. What, what is small that? Small ball. Small yeah. ball. Okay. Why the Golden State Warriors where they were just... It, basketball is a game of fight. But the Golden State Warriors, towards their championship runs, did it with really no dominant center, no top seven foot. So they call it small ball. Which is perfect for us 2016, Filipinos. 2017. <laughs> But people forget that we were doing that in Gilas in 2013, 2014. And we were getting all sorts of, of uh, bashing for it. Why are we playing two small point guards? Why do we have three little guys on the court? But it wasn't because I wanted to play small ball, but it was because I was always doing things that were constantly to throw the other teams off balance. Right. To make them, so you can call it unorthodox, you can call it out of the box. But for me, it was very simple. I just wanted to make sure that um, uh, if you're the favorite and I'm the challenger and I'm the underdog, I'll be damned if I'm going to do things your way. I mean, I think that's the definition of suicide, right? If, if you're going to go into a match and you're trying to, for example, we try to come and play the Americans and we go in with an American style of play. Mm -hmm. You cannot out America, America. <laughs> Or you go into Europe, uh, play the European teams and try a European style of play. You're not going to out-Europe the Europeans. Right. So we crafted our own uh, Filipino barabara -bara style okay. of basketball. That's <laughs> Gila's basketball. Okay. People say it's not too scientific. It's not too... So wait, is that where the puso came yes, in? The heart uh, yeah. of Filipino basketball? Yes. So that's that's uh, that was really the... The one thing that uh, I guess powered it, propelled it, because it wasn't always pretty, but we would never give up. We would never quit. We were a very, very resilient bunch. So when people today, the most requested topic for me is resilience. Okay. And, oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> Bring it on, because we live resilience for so long. I mean. Gila's program, Philippine basketball program, is nothing but a story of resilience. I mean, we are coming off 40 years of utility and we're still here. We're still plugging away. And uh, so essentially, that's, that's just uh, the kind of uh, thinking that we brought into uh, running the network as well. Just being able to do things differently, unorthodox, uh, out of the box, if you want. I mean... We didn't even think there was a box. There was even there was no box as far as we were concerned. Let's just let's just go out and do things anyway. 
we were uh, like I said, we were the number three. <laughs> we, you know, so. And I guess that's, that's the luxury also of uh, being a challenger. There's no um, expectation yeah. of you um, continuing on that trajectory, right? right? So you really have all of that leeway to try new things, to make mistakes, I guess. Yep. Uh, and, and in your case, uh, would you say that that strategy that you devised for the team of the network, did it uh, work? for the long haul? Well, it's too early to tell, but the fact that they're here, they're still here, they're around, and they're now doing other things uh, away from sports. You know, they're, they've signed some really good talent. They've acquired some really good properties. I think they're in the, again, through no, uh, no, uh, none of, uh, through not, no doing in my part, it's completely the new uh, management already. Um, uh, I think the, they're in the in a really good position. They're in a really good spot. Uh, but if, if if you're asking me if it's going to be successful in the long term, then only time will tell. So with Mr. MVP himself, you obviously had the autonomy, the mastery, the purpose because he allowed you the leeway to be able to do the things that you wanted to do. Um, what was I would say the biggest lesson that you learned from him. Um, MVP is a very simple, straightforward, powerful uh, take on leadership. For him, leadership is about uh, competence, integrity, passion. That's it for him. If, if he looks at leaders, he looks at leaders from those lens. Competence, integrity, passion, and for him, the most important is passion. Um, and so that, that's, that's what I've learned from him. So a lot of things that I've learned from him, really. But uh, uh, the, I think the most important is, is just that kind of a, uh, a simple, straightforward uh, look uh, at leadership and that for him, um, he values, obviously, integrity very much. Uh, and he values competence or technical skills very, very much. But time and time again, he said that the greatest of all of those that he looks for is passion. Puso. Yeah, puso. So that's right. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's what I learned from him. And that's why I developed that uh, puso framework of leadership, the heart of a leader mm -hmm. model. That's really... Uh, it's bad. And I told him, uh, and he's been very... He was very generous to lend his his uh, test, uh, you know, he to lend an endorsement to you know, we're, we're promoting my speaking space services and all that on, on the website. So, and he he gave uh, a really moving, a very very touching uh, words to that effect and on how important that was for him. So that's why I built that that heart of a leader framework, leadership framework. It's really about. It's really about your heart and it's really about engaging the hearts of your people. For me, that's what leadership is about. Wow. Okay. So now I'd like to go to your training organization, which is Coachcom. Yeah. So one would automatically assume that this was born after your career with <laughs> TV5 just because now you're in it full time. Yeah. Right. This is your full time gig, uh, yeah. I would say. And um, you started this back in the early 2000s. Yeah, way back. I was still coaching Coke. Yeah, Coca-Cola coach, yeah. Okay, so you were obviously not yet in your 50s, right? You were not in your yet. 40s, yeah. early 2000s. What were you thinking of putting up when you first built CoachCom? Um, when I started coaching uh, and I won with Pure Foods, I started getting invited to give this, these uh, talks corporate talks and, and all that, the motivational talks. Started with the Ayala Group. Obviously, they, they still own Pure Foods at that time. I had no idea what to talk about. And they just told me, you know, just tell us uh, the story of how you won that championship. So we did. Uh, I did. And then I just talked about the lessons that I learned from that. So they said, just talk to us about, uh, uh, tell us the story about your championship. Uh, and so I did. And then I just 
uh, talked about the lessons that I learned from that championship. And to my surprise, it was so well received. It was really, whoa, whoa. So I, and then... Because everyone watches basketball, right? And Yeah. And, and so everyone can relate. They, they could relate. They probably witnessed that championship. Yeah, because they're also part of the Ayala group. Exactly. The company was uh, in, in part of the Ayala group. And then another company invites me to a film life uh, to give a talk to their you know, awardees in the old Film Life Auditorium. I think there was a thousand people said, wow, I was so nervous and all that. But I said, same thing, just, just tell a story. So I did. It was so well-received. People were clapping. I said, okay. Ko, okay, to. Sabi ko, okay to. And There's then, a high that you get from the speaking circuit that you don't get from, I guess, the hard court, right? Yeah, it's because it's such a different audience. Right? It's a very different environment. So, uh, it, it it was kind of uh, very natural because I wasn't trying to teach or preach or train. I was just telling stories. And it turns out that's, that was a, a refreshing uh, thing for, for the audience to hear. So uh, I got, I started to get more and more invites to do these talks. And then that grew into the companies that had invited me to talk were starting now to thinking of engaging me to do more regular things. So I thought I was kind of like a management consultant. So that's when I decided to take my MBA uh, from the Edinburgh Business School. And that's where I found executive and corporate coaching. And that spoke to me, to who I am as a person. I was already a coach. Right, right. right. You don't already, <laughs> you have to, don't have to explain. You're naturally me. built for yeah. that role. So from management consultant, I said, yeah, this is what I want. I want to be a coach. So I put up the company, Coachcom. Plus, I, I had, you know, obviously, the more invites I got, companies had uh, were asking for invoices, official receipts, and all that. So I had to have a company. I had to have had a to company. Be legit. Yes, right. to handle <laughs> that. And then I came across John Maxwell. And then my Coca-Cola team, uh, uh, and even previously, my Pure Foods team, we had them do John Maxwell's uh, Seven Habits of Leadership. And then he comes to the Philippines, and then I go to Singapore. We get I get accredited as a licensed John Maxwell team builder. So then I get I, so then I started getting gigs for team building for organizations, not sports organization. So that's why Coachcom came around. So Coach Coachcom became my uh, kind of my vehicle for the speaking team building. And I was still doing basketball clinics, basketball stuff, you know, outside of actual coaching. So I had I had a, a, a real company. You know, we we invited Tex Winter here. Remember, we invited Tom Newell. We had so some other stuff that we were doing in basketball as well. So Coachcom became my vehicle for that in in two thousand two, um, and so it started growing. We started there. We put up a website. But then now we got so many inquiries and we kept saying no because I was still coaching right, full right. time. So I kept saying no and no and no. So we put down the website again because it was... It was getting to be a distraction. Yeah, and it was embarrassing right. to... Just always say no. To always say no. So um, it was on and off, on and off, on and off uh, until, uh, until when I decided, when I was retiring at 50 years old uh, from... Basketball coaching, I was really looking towards that already. So when I finished and, and I uh, finally retired from TV5, um, it was because of going to Coachcom full-time and we were going to expand. We were in expansion mode with Tony and Guy. And I was putting up my other business, the, our dialysis center. So it, I was going to be, I wanted to devote my full time and my efforts towards that and uh, uh, like I said that that's where we are now of course we we got hit by this pandemic which is so funny because all my talks and, and you can go back and ask the audience as all my talks in in the third quarter fourth quarter of last year 2019 I always ended it by saying mark my words we will all be disrupted it's not a matter of <laughs> If, but it's only a question of when. when. Little did I know that we would be disrupted by this <laughs> sooner than by this later. virus. But you know, so. But I was already talking about. So w w when I 
le- retired from TV5, I started asking my clients what are the things that you're grappling with, what are your pro- what are your things that you're interested in, and they were talking about agility. Agile was very very was top of mind for everyone. It was about uh, resilience. Was very very uh, emotional intelligence. So. I went and took my certification in in Singapore to be an agile leadership uh, and management coach, and uh, that's where I am now. So, uh, fortunately, before the pandemic hit, I was already able to get all of these uh, uh, certifications in place. And but you know, um, when when the when the pandemic hit, uh, business got really. Uh, affected because a lot of my uh, team building gigs we had a full schedule mm-hmm. all the way to well from that time was february we were full all the way to june already that wow. my half year was done um so that went out the window uh so we kind of struggled at first in march uh and april but uh, then Little by little, I just reached out to my uh, previous clients and I told them, what do you want? Do you need uh, anything? What are you struggling with today? I said, coach, can you talk to our people about uh, resilience? Because they're, you know, how to cope with this uh, thing because they're all worried. Um, I said, how? And then, so it, then the virtual talks. So you were doing your scouting report. Yeah. And, uh, and I was just offering it for free whatever you want so I talked to my previous guys and then so we figured out a, a, a good you know a good format for 35 40 minute talk 20 minutes for q a because before with live audiences it was difficult for q a people were kind of shy but on the on on zoom they just put it on the chat right. box you know and then the host will just ask it and all that so it was much easier so it's 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 it's, it's been very fun so the talks are about agility, resilience, emotional intelligence is very big, and leading in crises, uh, leadership in times of uncertainty. And then now, because people are already looking forward as we're coming out of the pandemic more and more, they're again thinking of teams. So uh, the heart and science of great teams is, is a talk and a program that that I'm running that is I think is very, very uh, helpful for because there's no place for you to go to learn about teamwork right and yet anyone whether you're a startup or a executive or you're running a business already everyone expects you as a leader to run your organization as a well-oiled machine or right. a good functioning team but the question is how you've we've been to our school they never thought fundamentals of t- you, teamwork you there was not no team building learn that in school that's something we that you learn yeah. when you're on the job we're, we're fortunate you're... we were athletes we have some idea but really how you know so if i get, put you in a position okay john what's the first thing you will do you're going to build this team what's the first thing you will do i mean you know so so that's where I, we come in that's where i come in and and even the my heart the heart is an acronym for health Emotional intelligence, agility, resilience, and teamwork or teammanship. Um, it's about uh, the how-to more than the know-how. Because all the leaders that I work with, they already, of course, they know the value of emotional intelligence, agility, resilience. The, re- the, the reason they are where they are is because they've been practicing all those things. But the question is, can they coach it? Right. Right. Which is a completely coach. different That's story. That's completely different. Yeah. Before, kasi, di ba, our, the old style was, you know, you just you just tag along and you'll get it. Right. You, 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 right, you'll right. figure this out. But now, we don't have that time. So now, you really have to be able to coach. You really have to be intentionally uh, and consciously coaching your people to be able to hasten that process. I would think... I would think that's something that people right now are struggling with because of the fact that you're not in close proximity to your leader, yeah. right? Um, whereas before, maybe someone could tag along and yeah, try to witness would... how things unfold and probably pick up a thing or two from that. But now it's a lot more different. I guess you have to be more deliberate. Right. 
because of the fact that they do not have access to you as a leader readily if you do not allow especially them to. now yeah especially now so do you have any advice for leaders out there who have teams that they've been used to leading in our old old normal which is you're in one mm-hmm. you know you probably have stand up meetings or even big meetings yeah, with them stand ups yeah but now you're forced to interact exclusively um, on the digital realm, Correct. which is very impersonal, which um, you cannot see the nuances of how they react to you and vice versa, right? The, you, cannot, you can't read the body language. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So what would you say would be, um, I guess, a good way to transition to, I guess, a more digital interaction with people from, I guess, different, you know, you have your middle managers, you have your, I guess, rank and file who still look to you yeah. for that, but obviously now do not have access to you. Um, I think the most important thing is to still remember that even in this virtual time, well, I think even more important now, the value of trust really becomes more critical and uh, the leaders today have to um, really think about it, take into account how do I how do I continue uh, building that trust level with my direct reports with with my, the people under me. And um, there are several ways that that we teach that, but. Uh, the most important thing is, especially at this time when you have meetings, you got to make sure that the first thing you do is don't jump into the agenda first. You got to make sure that how are you, you ask them how they are doing. You first. connect first. Yeah, you connect. That, that's even more important now more than ever. Because I've been to so many meetings and I'm seeing that all over. Uh, uh, I do a lot of team coaching where I sit on actual meetings and now it's their virtual meetings of, of teams that I coach. So uh, we do a lot of those things first. You make sure you're, you're, you're able to connect. And you make sure that you connect on... Uh, you, you have to show up authentically. And for me, authenticity is, um, is honesty without self-righteousness. Because you know how it is as leaders, we have, a, we have the tendency to... Yeah, well, I'm very honest. I'm t- saying things that it is, but it's almost like I'm right, you're wrong. Right, right, right. But that, that self-righteous mm, mm. tone of voice or thinking. So, um, so you have to have that honesty, by the self-righteousness and vulnerability. You have to be very vulnerable. If you're feeling something, if you're worried, don't be afraid to to share it as well. So I think there. So. That's part of our of our program and our models. We actually teach, you know, tools or, or tips for for building trust. Um, that's where it starts. That that one on one trust that you have with your people, and then um, you must make sure that you're able to build psychological safety, which is group trust, obviously. Uh, so that's the the starting point of of, of building teams. So in this day and age, uh, there is a science, but there's also an art to this virtual platform, right? It's, it's a, so you have to make sure that you can see them. You have to make sure that video is on. You have to be uh, conscious of the same things, whether, whether it's face-to-face or, or virtual, just... Uh, you listen to what they're saying, and you you also listen to what they're not saying, uh, and then you you have to be very perceptive. Very interesting. Listen to what they're not saying. Yeah, I think that's that's as as, as important, right? And then uh, we give you tools to just ask those questions. So we in the we have an agile coaching practice where we're taught to. Uh, uh, start strong, go deep. Uh, uh, start strong, go deep. Uh, start fast, go deep. Finish strong, because right now, unlike before, where you had a lot of time, now in the in the virtual, there's such a thing as Zoom fatigue, right? So, right. 
So we have a lot of these tools where it's very important that uh, your uh, the leaders are still able to to be present. In fact, I think leading with uncertainty now is more about being than than the doing. And I and I always remind leaders that I talk to. There's uh, we all know work life balance. We should, but a lot of leaders we forget. We are deficient in work leadership balance. What is that? So as leaders, we are preoccupied with the analysis, the business decision, strategy, and all that. We forget the leadership part of our work. We're preoccupied with the work part of our work. We forget the leadership part of our work. Listening, putting ourselves in their position, um, empathy, and all those other things that are the higher up you go in organizations, in the hierarchy, those are the more important things as a leader. You know, at the start, obviously, when you're an individual contributor, it's all about your skills and what you can call it, the work. But as you get promoted, you know, that balance starts to tilt. And the higher up you go, it's less about your skills. It's really more about your leadership. So you have to understand that. So people, a lot of leaders, they forget that work leadership balance. And as you said earlier, it's about inspiring um, yes. your people as well. Yes. Uh, more importantly, in that role Correct. that you have now, right? Yeah. So that's those are the things that, you know, that I, I, I that, that's where I come in and I speak to leaders and organizations about to remember to not not to forget these things because these are important now more than ever in times of uncertainty because the leaders today and and our staff they 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 told me the same thing. Uh, well, in Tagalog, they, they, they told me, eh, boss, kayo na lang ang sinasandalan namin. I mean, you're the only one we can lean on. In, in times of turmoil and chaos and uncertainty, the leader is the emotional beacon, if you will. You know? So they get their, their strength and their, from, from, from the leader. So if you don't have that yourself, that's, that's why for me, my number one rule for motivation, first be self-motivated yourself first. The double redundancy. Wow. So you have to be self-motivated first because otherwise, especially in times of uncertainty. Wow. So many nuggets of wisdom <laughs> that I'm getting from you from this conversation. Yeah. I, I think it's um, totally exceeding uh, any preconceived notion I've had of how this conversation will turn out. <laughs> Okay, so now I'll get into my, my 10 questions for you. All right, so Coach Chot Reyes, <laughs> what makes you Asian? Or in particular, what makes you Filipino? Um, I think my eyes makes me unmistakably Asian and my nose makes me Filipino. Same but, here. Yeah. <laughs> um, other than that, I think my preference for food, I'm a huge... Filipino food junkie, but I'm also a huge Asian, Southeast Asian food junkie. Most Asian food I, I really, really love. What Filipino food would you recommend that foreigners try? Um, balot is, um, you know, right up there with the... Uh, all of, all of my try. players, <laughs> Phil Amps imports, the first thing they do when they get here, that's our initiation, right? They have to eat balot. So for those who don't know, what is balot? Uh, what is it? But it's duck's egg, uh -huh. right? It's it's duck's egg. It's uncooked. <laughs> it's uncooked. Well, it's cooked, but um, it's, it's, it's an embryo. Yeah, it's a duck, duck embryo. embryo. Yeah, and uh, it's it's fantastic. It's. Uh, but the thing is, you know, in in those fear factor shows, they always kind of put bal balut in a like it's it's disgusting. It's, it's yeah. you know, so it doesn't really paint a, a beautiful picture of Filipino cuisine, You're right? right? Yeah. So if you were to change that misconception, uh, what is the one dish that you would serve to your foreign guests to make them appreciate? Uh, that is not balut. That is not it's balut, not, okay. yes. Hmm. Sinigang. Sinigang. Yeah. So what is sinigang or, or what I goes into making? I don't know how to explain <laughs> that in English. Uh, it's, a, it's kind of a... Sour broth soup with beef. It can be fish or shrimp. A lot of veggies in there. And it is made with... Ano ba sinigang? Suka? Vinegar? Ano ba yun? Huh? Tamarind. 
Yes. Whether it's natural or yeah, yeah, uh, it, it, the it, cubes. It's, it's, yeah, the, the tamarind uh, broth. Uh, yeah. And it's, uh, I think you will find that's, that's something that uh, uh, sinigang with white rice, steaming bowl of white rice. Definitely. Yeah. With rice. You cannot eat sinigang without and, rice. And then you have to dip it in um, fish sauce with uh, green pepper, with chili. Yeah, so that's, that's the Filipino. What makes me Filipino is that I love eating my pandesal, my bread, dip it in coffee. And I eat my fried rice and I put coffee on my fried wow. rice. Wow. That's what makes me feel it. Well, I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah. So that's a thing, huh? Oh, <laughs> you see? Oh. Coffee, huh? Coffee. Coffee on your fried rice with your cinnamon, wow. yeah, with okay. your tapsilo. So that's oh, another that's version cool. of champurado, which is chocolate rice. Yeah. It, right? Yeah, but it's just, yeah, this is different. So I'm learning something new because I didn't even know that was a thing. You coffee. try it. You, you okay. have coffee with, 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 with cream, huh? it's it's not good with black, but coffee with cream, and then uh, your fried rice, and you're eating tapa or or whatever with beef. it, beef beef tapa or fish, and then you like soup. Oh wow! Like I think like soup. I think I have to try that. You I've never I've it. never tried oh, that. Yeah. <laughs> That's hella pinoy. <laughs> so pinoy. I love wow. it. Wow! In fact, I just had it. Uh, no, no. <laughs> Today, I had my pandesal dipped in coffee. Uh, yesterday, I had uh, sinangag, yeah. Wow. Fried rice with coffee. <laughs> okay. So, Coach, um, in your field, there are a lot of heroes in your field. Uh, people idolize basketball players, athletes, um, corporate executives. In your opinion, to you, who is a modern-day superhero or what qualities would this person have um, for them to be considered by you as a modern day superhero well we, we talked about him already earlier mvp i think uh, not only because of his business acumen but being able to work up close and personal with him i've seen how much he really cares for our country and a lot of the things he does uh whether it's increasing the number of hospital beds uh, in the country uh, or, or improving the road network or improving water facilities, electricity and stuff for, for, for the country uh, is really meant to help the plight of the Filipino. So for me, that quality of using your business acumen and resources for the good of others and that's what drove also my desire to have a dialysis business in, in you know in that field to be able to help. And our dialysis business is the one that's for the lower income uh, market. There's a huge uh, market there. Uh, we're not going after the high income uh, patients, but we're really to serve the lower income market. Um, so that's that's uh, that, that's one uh, obviously of of my heroes in in the in the in the business world. So what I'd like to know is if you were to give a commencement speech, um, what would be, I guess, your advice to students who are graduating now, particularly now at this very challenging time? Um, what is the one advice that you could give them that will help them navigate this new world that we now find ourselves in? Very, very simple. Don't ever, 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 ever give up. Don't ever give up. Uh, I think that's the number one thing I will say. Don't give up. Uh, but in the same breath, I'll tell them it's not about you. You know, it's, it's not about you. Uh, so go out and have fun. I think that's, for me, uh, that's my message. Don't ever give up. Don't take yourself too seriously. Uh, go out and have fun. We can have all other experiences and stories all around it, but I think for for graduates of today, I think that's what they need to hear. So resilience, more than ever, yeah. should be part and parcel of their, I guess their their skill set. Yeah, and and that other 
other consciousness. It's not about you because right now they have a tendency to be it's all about right. them, right? So it's not about you. I've learned that the hard way so many times. Just as not every rejection is about you yeah. and your inability to land that job or close that Correct. deal, yeah. right? So that so it's not every success only about you, right? So, so that's uh, so for me. That's I think the most important thing that they should learn today. Yeah, you've had a very long career, and I'm just curious to know what keeps you up at night, um, and what gets you up in the morning, or you know, yeah. is, is there something that you feel you still need to do or accomplish? Uh, first of all, I'm a very, very sound sleeper. And my wife says, how can you do it? You just, as soon as your back hits the bed, you're asleep. <laughs> That's a skill. Right? Yeah. Because I, 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 I feel I, I, I haven't wronged anyone. I haven't, you know, I, there's nothing that I need to hide. So, um, but if there's something that keeps me up at night, it's always a thought that there's something that I still need to do. There's almost... Something that's something that I need to do, and then now in during this pandemic, what keeps me up really is, well, both me and my wife, we we are constantly worried about our people. You know, we we hope that we can continue uh, uh, running the business, being operational, so that our people will continue to have their livelihood. So that keeps us up at night. Um, what gets me up in the morning is just the excitement of what's the day in store, what the day has in store for me. Because I, I'm a very strong believer in, in, in the growth mindset and I'm constantly learning, constantly trying new things, constantly stretching myself. So I, I'm asking always myself, what does the day have in store for me? So I was up very early. I, I, I slept, at, I think... I. Four before I went to bed this morning. Four, I, four a.m. I, I watched the U.S. Open golf. Oh, okay. Finished <laughs> it. Bry, Bryson Shambo won it. So, but I was up like six because well, I had to. I have my regular morning route. I don't know if that's part of your ten questions. I think, but you know, but I have my regular morning routine. So yes, you know. Speaking of which, <laughs> I saw on your LinkedIn, uh, you had a, I believe was a yoga instructor uh, <laughs> in your house. My, my son. My son is a licensed, uh, is a registered yoga teacher. Oh, okay. Yeah. Which, uh, who is this? Who's this uh, Moses. Moses Mosh, is yeah. a licensed yoga yeah, teacher. Yeah. So that's something that you've taken up during the pandemic. Yeah. So uh, I've, been, yeah, I've been, I've, I was doing it very sporadically in the past, but during the pandemic more regularly, I'm really, Forcing myself, and I'm really the worst guy for because I'm the stiffest guy and the most un inflexible guy. I know I'm so stiff, but <laughs> you know, just my constantly trying to to grow and stretch because I always talk about stretching literally. comfort zone, literally. So that was really my way of challenging myself, and I think I'm getting a little bit better at it. But yeah, so when you say road work, what do you mean by it's that? It's a five k. <laughs> I call it a 5K run, jog, walk, sprint. Oh, okay, <laughs> yeah. okay. Uh, so uh, I just, it, it, it's a combination of a nature walk for me to go out, have sun, and just appreciate the nature because I, I teach that also in my talks. You have to go out and appreciate it, start from a place of gratitude. So one of the ways to be grateful that I teach is to go out and appreciate nature. Just so. so that's part of it. Uh, and also part of my physical fitness routine. There's an incline in our place, in, in our village. I try to I sprint that up and down five times. I sprint the same incline. Yeah. It's about, um, what, maybe 20 degrees? Yeah, it's about 20 degrees. So, so um, and then I... I got some work done because I have, uh, after this, I'm having a talk at two o'clock. Uh, so I, I prepared for that. Yeah, you know, that's very interesting uh, about how you talked about that. So you have your walks, you have your maybe light jog, but you also have your sprint, right? Yeah. Your uphill sprint, the anaerobic yes. um, exercise it's that always is always, always very important. Very, yeah. Because some people think, okay, to, to have a regular routine, it has to be a lot of cardio, yeah. a lot of jogging or biking but 
uh, not everyone is really into also balancing it out with yes. anaerobic exercises such as Especially sprinting. Especially at, at, at my age. Right. At my age, you know, we, I tell people just walk. Who cannot walk? <laughs> just, I have a 5, 10, 15 minute walk. Who cannot do that? I mean, and I posted today, uh, I do a regular Monday motivation piece on mm-hmm. Instagram or, or, or LinkedIn and, and LinkedIn. And I posted a story about uh, a classmate and I actually posted the Viber message that he sent me where he wanted to call me about his uh, physic, his exercise regime, ah, regimen, his exercise regimen. And so we talked about it, upper, everything, everything that he needs to get him out of his wheelchair because oh. he just had his lower leg amputated here. And his right leg was amputated years ago already here. Wow. So now he really needs. So so I'm saying, here is a guy, he has no legs. And he's concerned about his physical fitness regimen. So you cannot, what's your excuse? <laughs> I mean, you know, so, so I did that already today. So I, I, I got all of those uh, things done already. It's, it's not even lunchtime yet and you've, yeah. you've done so much. Yes, and because that, that's what I like doing. So that's what gets me up every day is to what can I do today? And I want, I, and I want to do things already because um, like, like you said before lunch, I've, I pride myself in already doing more things than the regular person would be able to do in a day. Right. What time do you get up in the morning? Five is my regular five, five okay. thirty. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes, uh, if I have something, if I need to do something, four thirty. But yeah, five five thirty is my regular. But you get enough rest, right? What time in the evening do you do you sleep? That that's something that I'm really working on now to get. <laughs> finally, I'm getting a chance to get seven eight hours. Whereas before. Yeah, whereas before, four five hours, and there was. That mistaken macho notion, sleep is for wimps, <laughs> right? And then all of that. But now, so the key is if you get up at 5, at 10 or 11, you're, you're sleeping, you're ready to sleep. So I can empathize with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so it's nice. I have my red wine, go to bed. And the problem is uh, when there's US Open, last week there's US Open <laughs> tennis, next week there's going to be French Open or the, the Formula One, so it's all of this midnight stuff. It's getting, it's messing up with my sleeping rhythm. But I still always get up in at same time, very early to get my workout done. It's a very, I have a very precise routine, so that you know I do so many things already. I do my breathing exercise, my meditation, my I, I do a little bit of writing. Before I even open my email, before I even took, take a look at this, mm. I don't look at this until breakfast time. Okay, until eight nine o'clock. So, I teach that eh? the worst thing you can do when you wake up is to look at your. Okay, why do, you, why do you think that is? So, first thing you do when you wake up, what, what do you do exactly? Well, my belief is, uh, to be successful, you have to have a habit of winning and to get that habit, win your mornings. That's something that's completely your control. Win your mornings first. So first thing I do when I wake up, as soon as I open my eyes, I, I say thanks right away. Thank you. I'm, I'm, you know, nothing happened to me that night. I'm okay. Then I do a little stretching routine while I'm still asleep. I'm, I'm still lying down. I stretch, stretch, stretch a little bit. I get up and I have a glass of water. I have a jug right beside my... I, take water before I sleep and the minute I wake up, I, I sit up, I take water. Then I go and brush my teeth with my left hand. I, I learned this from Jim Quick. When you oh. brush your teeth with your off hand, okay. you're practicing your mind for to focus because it's difficult. Oh, it's right, hard. right. Okay. Yeah. That's, so that's a focusing exercise. I, I thought it would have something to do with um, the, if you brush with your left hand and you're right-handed, of exercising the right part of your Maybe, brain, yeah. right? I, 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 I'm more sure. creative in that sense, yeah, right? I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure that's also part of it. It's like you're re- rewiring yeah. your brain to take on something new, a new skill. And then I go to my office and, and I do my breathing. I, do, I have a 10, 15 minute breathing protocol, uh, kind of breathing or meditation, if you want to call it that way. Can you share with us the, what, what that is, uh, the breathe, breathing protocol that you have? 
yeah. uh, like a quick. Um, yeah, I guess. It's, it's it's very simple. It's just you know you unseated the. Just fl- feet flat. Uh, just make sure you're breathing the right way. You know, okay. you're, when you inhale, it's your stomach that is expanding. Okay. Right? When you inhale, because a lot of us we inhale, our chest expands, eh? and you know, for, that's the wrong way to breathe. When so you it's inhale, the diaphragm. It's the diaphragm. Taking the air. So uh, I I do a breathing protocol where uh, I have my exhale more than my inhale. So I do an inhale to the ca- four counts. And then exhale for six counts. Then I hold my breath for two seconds, two counts, and then inhale again. So that's twelve seconds. So I, I do five cycles of that. That's already one minute. Oh, so okay. so I do five, ten, fifteen minutes of that because when you exhale more than you inhale, it uh, activates your parasympathetic nervous system. That's the relaxing you know so i just do it to center myself for the day to make sure that you know whatever i'm not preparing or i'm not planning i'm not thinking of my day i'm just uh i'm just creating space for myself to 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 be relaxed and centered and no uh unclutter no no clutter in my mind so that's a superpower. I actually picked it up from Phil Jackson. From he, Phil Jackson. Yeah, he talks about that okay. a lot in in his books. And then I had a chance to visit uh, the, his first year with the Lakers. Uh, in practice, I, I became I got to be close to Tex Winter, so invited. And and Phil Jackson's practice is practices are completely closed off to outsiders. Wow. In okay. fact, when I went before their practice facility was built at, at uh, Health South, they were practicing at. Uh, for a, a certain college in Sa- Santa Barbara. Uh, so I went there and I said, I asked, the, I, I saw this guy, where's the gym? So he said, oh, he, he pointed me out. So, so, so he asked me, so who are you? I, I'm a coach from so-and-so. So why, why are you here? I'm, I'm here to watch the Lakers practice. So he said, oh, good luck. I'm a coach of the, he's, he was the coach of the school. I'm the coach here, and I even I can't watch practice. Wow. Okay, but yeah, because of text winter, I was allowed back. So yeah, they do that every practice. The and Lakers do their breathing every practice. And Kobe then, was there, Shaq wow. was there, everyone. So, so Gilas, Talk and Text, all my teams, we do a lot of breathing. That's exercise. what you picked up from yeah. him. That's and I, I saw, uh, I think everyone, every basketball fan, saw. Um, the Jordan documentary. I yeah. think if you, uh, if you at any point in your life was interested in basketball, um, you would have seen it. And yeah. and that's one thing I picked up uh, from from Phil also is that the the Zen the Zen the Zen yeah. of just centering yourself, um, whether it's in practice, whether it's in the actual game. And the, it starts from that from that breath work from the breathing exercise. Well. A lot of people now call it mindfulness or mindfulness leadership, whatever. But yeah, that it, it takes its roots from that, from that Zen uh, Buddhism. Yeah, so even I have uh, I I've completed the course positive psychology and mindfulness, and that it really takes its roots from that from Buddhism. So that's my morning. Uh, I do a little bit of writing, and then is the only time. I'll open up my email to check what I have for the day. Or when you say writing, what kind of writing would this be? Um, I'm doing sometimes uh, preparing for a talk or I'm writing a new module for uh, a workshop or something comes to my mind and, and I want to write. I, I design, I put together a, a training program or a leadership workshop, a module to add to my... Uh, uh, the num the programs that we offer on on the on on Coachcom so so I always do you know so, so I, I always I, I like doing that I love doing those things or I might be writing for uh for my next LinkedIn post or my next whatever so, so up until that point no exposure to social media at all so and this would be till around what time uh, breakfast uh, at about. 7.30 or 8, uh, my wife will wake up and that's our that's almost sacred for us, our breakfast together. Mm-hmm. So we always have breakfast together and that's the only time. Then, you know, 
having while uh, having breakfast then uh, of course i uh, d- dive so when i wake up i'll do my writing and also at about 6:30 or 7 uh, i'll go and do my whether it's it's the road work or just HIIT or some kind of exercise until 7.30 or 8, it's time to wake up my wife. And, wow. Yeah, so do. And then in the afternoon, if because if, my wife, for her, she's she's not a morning person, so her workout and road work is afternoon. So that's my second. So we'll, <laughs> But it's just walking, so it's, right. it's okay. It's, it's a nice. But it's still, you know, if you get four kilometers walking, it's, it's still movement, right? So it's still good. It still to, piles up. Yeah, to put it in. And that's wonders for your relationship to do it with your wife, right? Oh, yes, I agree. Yeah, I agree. So. For a time, we lived in the same village. Um, I wouldn't see you. I, I think yeah. um, you're, you're a bit far from where I was, but I agree. I mean, taking walks, yeah. r- runs with your partner, I think that's um, yeah. that's very good for the relationship. Correct. Something I, I, I feel sometimes I wish we could have the same luxury even when we get to our old Correct. ways yeah. of, you know, I think post-pandemic, right? Hopefully. Um, you know, that's, I think, a, a luxury that we, we all find ourselves. So that's what gets me up in the morning. How about a second that into that question? <laughs> what a long answer to that question. Okay. You know, um, You've had a very storied career, um, both in sports and now in the corporate scene. But what is the one thing that um, maybe if you could bring back the hands of time or if you could tell yourself or something that you would have learned um, or at least knew sooner in life that you know now? Um, Self-restraint, I guess. Just more... um, uh, I think I have uh, said some things and 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 said uh, some hurtful words to some people that I wish I I never said. I may have been right. I may have been justified to do it, but still, you know, uh, I always think that uh, uh, it's better if you did not, if I did not say it. So. Was it so in the heat of the moment? Oh. Yeah. You don't have to get into no. specifics. Uh, yeah. a, lot of it is, the... a lot of it is in the heat of the moment. But now, uh, especially in the latter years, all the technical fouls I got in my latter years as a coach were because I intentionally wanted to get it. Oh. But if you take okay. a look even in, in all our tournaments in, in, in Gilas, in Asia, in the World Cup and all, I, not, I did not get one technical foul because I've already mastered that part of the emotional intelligence part, self-restraint, self-control. So what would merit you intention and intentionally wanting to get that technical foul? Is it merely to fire up the team? It can be either lighting a fire uh, within the team. It can be calling the attention of the ref. It can be changing the momentum of a game. Maybe I don't have a timeout anymore. I need to uh, cause a game stoppage so I can talk to them can be a, a lot of different things. Or it can be just sometimes really showing my uh, displeasure. Right. right? So, or maybe I'm already thinking of the next game. That, you know, we don't get this call anymore in the next game. So there's a lot so of... So it's, it's sending a message Sending as well. a message, yeah. So, you know. And ob- obviously the one thing that I don't want to happen that I, I regret is the, is the Australian bro right. that right. incident. So uh, um, for those who are not familiar, can you... Take us through um, what led to that brawl. Well, there was, was a series of incidents. It started the day before at practice where the Australian team during their practice tore off the decal in the the floor decals in the in the uh, court. And, and it was pretty personal to us because it was the PLDT decals. They're the major sponsors, our management, the, the team MVP was very upset about it. And then before the game, very few people know that before the game, they were already taunting and, and shoving our players, Calvin and some of our players, during the warm-up lines, the warm-up drills. Uh, but precisely, and pe- somebody already went to the dugout to tell me, Coach, you got to go out there already because something's before the game. And so I, it, I, in fact, told our players, settle down, we're the host, don't, let, don't mind them. Don't. Because... 
remember, Australia came to Manila coming off a loss to Japan. They did totally did not expect to lose to Japan, so they were kind of already hot under the collar right. from that. So I told the, the players, you know, let it go, don't let it affect you. And the whole game, there was a lot of taunting and, and you know, even to us, to the bench, their players were making gestures to us. But I kept telling the players, hold it, don't, don't, don't react. But I guess up to a, you can only hold your temper or, or control yourself up to a point. So when that incident happened, and, and, and granted, uh, our player, uh, Roger, gave a, a hard foul on, on the Australian player, but it was a basketball foul, and it was the referee called the foul. But then the, the blow, uh, the elbow of uh, that guy Kickert on, in retaliation, he was not the one fouled. He was just retaliating for his teammate on Pogoy, that blind uh, side elbow was completely not a basketball play. It was a dead ball situation. It happened right in front of our bench, and it was just impossible to control. We and a melee ensued yeah, then after the melee that. Ensued. Um, I did not get involved. Maybe I would have tried. I, maybe I should have tried to stop and 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 restrain players. But I already tried it in the past, and what happened was I just got so. I've learned long before that you don't get in the way of six foot ten guys who are trying to fight because that's really a surefire way. And my worry is if I get hit, I'm going to hit back. Okay. And I did not want that to happen. So I uh, intentionally controlled myself and uh, and so on. So I wish, I, I up to today, I feel that uh, our actions, I think if it happens again, I think we will react the same way. Um, but I, it's still, I wish it, it, it did not happen. It was something that hopefully the game ended a different way. Let me put it that way. What so, was your biggest lesson or takeaway from that moment? Um, and the events that followed? How you talked to the media, how you engaged? Well, we took, obviously, I took accountability. I said in the end, I'm responsible because I'm the coach. Uh, the other coach, uh, assistant coach, Luke Longley, said that I instructed them to do it. And because somebody posted that uh, on in the huddle that I, I I told them to give a hard foul. But, you know, if you know basketball, the, that's, that's just coaches speak for give a hard foul and be physical. And we have so many videos of Popovich, Steve Kerr, all of these great coaches saying the same thing. Be nasty, give a hard foul, make them hit the floor. That's... that's Coach speak for you know for 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 being physical. It doesn't mean go out and 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 uh, and so hit not somebody. not like in a Cobra Kai kind of way. No, no, not never, at all. Never, not at all, <laughs> not at all in a Cobra Kai kind of way. So uh, so I wish. So, so what I learned is is that uh, um, when you take responsibility, when you take accountability, it it can. Uh, uh, it, it can be uh, detrimental or it, it can go either way. I think that's the best way to say it. But I still think, given the circumstance, I, I, I would do the same thing. I, I wish it didn't happen that way, but uh, uh, I'll take accountability and given what happened, all, you know, I got fined and all the bashing and all the whatever you want. But I, I, I understand those things and that's that's part of my, my work. That's part of my job. And along with that comes the acceptance, I guess, of everything. Yeah. All the decisions, um, that's, that's, the reactions. That's part of it. That's part of it. Yeah. So I'd like to segue now to... And we all die. We all will die eventually. <laughs> what, what would you like for your epitaph to say? Uh, so here lies... Uh, uh, a father, a husband, a son, a brother, a friend, a coach, a winner. Um, he made others' lives better. I think something, something as simple as that. Okay, one final thing. Um, there's so many things that I learned from you today. Um, I can't even begin to describe the, the many ways that I can take um, the nuggets of wisdom that I got from this conversation. So. I used to coach the, the, the Ateneo track and field team for a while. I think I did it for about a year, year and a half. But, um, you know, right now I'm, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. 
um, you know, I'm, I'm doing this and I'm doing a lot of things as well. Um, but I'd like to ask you if there's one thing um, that you recommend I try. It could be something that you're doing now. It could be something that you're planning on doing um, that you can speak of that you would recommend for me to try uh, as someone who maybe was a former coach, but now is in the business, uh, I guess, ecosystem and startup community and all that also and media as well, which is kind of along the lines of where you've also um, had your career in terms of the, traje the trajectory. Uh, what would you recommend that I try? <laughs> ha huh. I think I think the one thing peculiar to my situation that very few people have gone through is yes I've been widely celebrated but I've also been widely vilified and hated on but I don't know how you can put yourself in that position to try that <laughs> but I think you know getting in that position and surviving it teaches you a lot uh, about yourself. You know, when you, uh, uh, when you get really the kind of vitriol I got before when the team would lose or whatever. You know how it is here, right, in the Philippines, in Manila, when the team wins, the players are good. When the, coach, when the team loses, it's the coach's fault. So... <laughs> We'd lose to number three Argentina and people are going to be cussing me to death and we'd lose by two points, three points. You never, win. You never points. really win. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, hmm. What is something realistic that you can really try? I'm getting the sense here that is what you're saying more along the lines of you have to, you have to risk um, going after the untested, yeah. I guess. The, I guess going back to how you tackled your role in TV5, just going after what may not be the obvious. Because if you do that, then maybe there's the bigger payoff that's possible. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think my past, well, up to last year, I don't know how you can put yourself in that position, but my past, I think the five years were really, really a huge test for me that I was running a network, I was doing my business, I was still an entrepreneur, I was still giving talks, and I was coaching the national team. So that combination of pressure, stress, demands on your time, you know, that, that it, really, it really molds you, it, you know, it, it really... You're, you're either going to get better or you're going to break. So that's my challenge to you. I don't know how you can put yourself in that uh, uh, position. But, you know, when I, when I talk to executives and organizations that I work with, uh, the fact is, yes, I've, I've been successful, but I've also failed a lot. And, but I'm here and I'm still here to talk to you about the experiences. So... So I've, I've survived it. Uh, so for you, I don't know how you can kind of put yourself uh, in that, sh in, in that uh, position. But just because there's one thought that the school of thought that says stick to what you know, stick to your lane and, and all that. But there's right more and more now people are saying, no, it's time for doing so many other different things. Right. I, I want to yeah. get into that because there's one school of thought that says you have to focus, right? Yeah. You have to give your all. Um, you have to be able to stay in your lane. But, but then again, and you're a case in point, there is also the other side where you can be successful in a lot of different fields. Yeah. Doing everything um, to your... I guess the best way that you can, but also excelling in all of them. And what is the code that needs to be cracked for you to be able to do that? Because I would think it would be a great amount of effort just to be excellent in one field, right? But to have four or five, which is something sometimes I feel, can I actually take this on? It's another thing that's, yeah. um, 
uh, going it's, to demand time for me. I think the most important thing is, uh, again, what, your purpose. It's, it's got to be something that you really love doing. It's got to be worth it. Um, otherwise, I would suggest just stick to your lane. But if there's a big, a compelling purpose behind it, I think that's, I think that's the differentiator. And and I believe that this is the age of the multi-hyphenated the creature, right? Right. The generalist. Yeah, also. you are the, you are a, an entrepreneur slash media slash host slash whatever, content creator. And you can excel in all. I think you, you know, we. I think we can have our cake and eat it too. Uh, I think the principle of abundance is it shouldn't be an end or but you must be you must really know why you're doing it I think that's the most important thing you have to understand what really matters and uh, have the I guess discipline and the commitment to go out there and, and do get it done and I think that's that's the best way I can put it and with that I think that's the perfect way to end this conversation so thank you very much Coach Chot Reyes, My the, pleasure. One, the yeah. one and only Coach Chot <laughs> Reyes for, um, for gracing this podcast. It's been a, an absolute pleasure mm -hmm. just to have you here and, and, and picking your brain. I know that a lot of our listeners will probably um, you know, walk out of this conversation, I think probably testing some of the things that you've, <laughs> you've shared here today. And I wish you success with um, all of your endeavors. But for those who'd like to um, find you, get in touch with you, follow you, uh, where can they do this? I'm all over social media. I, my Instagram is coachot, C-O-A-C-H-O-T. That's my LinkedIn profile as well. Uh, the um, website is coachcom.ph, uh, www.coachcom.ph. And I also launched a new website for my speaking engagements. That's uh, www.chotreyes.com. So... It's it's hard not it's it's hard it's not hard to find me online so I'm all over the place and and uh, and again my purpose is to help develop the next generation of Filipino leader so uh, that's that's really my focus uh, in, in this next chapter and uh, I hope the listeners uh, grow or, or become that they are the next generation of Filipino leaders because God knows we need it the people like you. Thank you very much, Coach, Thank for you. sharing everything that you yes, shared sir. today. Thank you. Okay. And that was Coach Chot Reyes. This episode is brought to you by TechnoGym. We've partnered with TechnoGym for equipment recommendations for your home gym. So if you're looking for gear that will help you elevate your home gym experience to the next level, just go to technogym.com and type the Methods to Greatness promo code MTG. That's MTG, and we'll hook you up with the best premium home gym equipment in the market today. If you would like me to interview anyone on the face of the earth and want them on the podcast, or if you want to collaborate with us for future content or sponsorship opportunities, or if you just have any recommendations on how we can get better, just send us an email at hello at methodstogreatness.com. That's hello at methodstogreatness.com. Until then, we'll see you next time.